fun text in front of us. Um, all right. Good Sunday, everybody, Pete said. Yeah, it is Sunday. How about that? Yep. And just like that, we are, uh, we are into, the, into, the, into the weekend. Hmm. All right. It's August 9th, gang. And uh, you might recall that yesterday we began looking at the book of Daniel. And we got through Daniel chapter 1 and 2. Now, we're reading from the Chronological Bible and similar uh, kinds of things that we've seen in the past books where we kind of go back and forth between, uh, between storylines. We are going to look at uh, Jeremiah again today primarily, a little bit in Kings as well. But we're going to be looking at this passage that was happen happening really coinciding with the exile and Daniel being in captivity and Meshach and... Abednego as pals and all those guys are hanging out, uh, kind of becoming uh, eunuchs and working for the king. And uh, <laughs> now, now we're uh, we're back to Jeremiah. Uh, Jehoiakim must have a death wish. He callously burned God's written word, and now, with the strength of a mouse pursuing a lion. Jehoiakim has the audacity to rebel against Nebuchadnezzar. So, death wish, right? Fortunately for Judah, Nebuchadnezzar does not react with immediate military force, or at least not directly. However, he may well be the motivating force behind the attacks against Judah by several of its neighbors over a four-year period of inconclusive war. Now, Jehoiakim is destined to live his last days in weary conflict. But then he turned against Nebuchadnezzar and rebelled. The Lord sent Babylonia, Armenia, Moabites, uh, Ammonites, uh, raiders against him to destroy Judah in accordance with the word of the Lord proclaimed by his servants, the prophets. Surely, these things happened to Judah according to the Lord's command in order to remove them from his presence because of the sin of Manasseh and all he had done, including the shedding of innocent blood. For he had filled Jerusalem with innocent blood, and the Lord was not willing to forgive. Perhaps it is during these years of conflict with old enemies of Judah and Jeremiah bring, brings the following judgments against those enemies. Concerning Moab, this is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, says. So God has some strong words, again, against the enemies of the uh, land with which God had given his people, but he's not happy with his people. So concerning Moab, this is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, says. Uh, it's so funny, when I read that the first time, I, I for whatever reason, uh, you know, I, I, Hamilton was in my mind, and I went, woo to Nebo, or woe to Nebo. For it will be ruined. It'll be absolutely ruined. Uh, uh, Kirithan will be it will be disgraced and captured. The stronghold will be disgraced and shattered. Moab will be praised no more in Heshbon. People will plot her downfall. Come, let us put an end to the na that nation. You, the people of Madaman will also be silenced. The sword will pursue you. Cries of anguish arise in Heroian, Heronian, cries of great havoc for destruction. Moab will be broken. Her little ones will cry out. They go up to the hill to Luath, weeping bitterly as they go on the road down to Heronium. Anguish cries over the destruction are over the destructions are heard. Flee, run for your lives, become like a bush in the desert. Since you trust in your deeds and riches, you too will be taken captive. Like uh, Chemish will go into exile together with the priests and the officials. The destroyer will come against every town. Not a town will escape. The valley will be ruined, the plateau destroyed. Because the Lord has spoken. Put salt on Moab, for she will be laid waste. Her towns will become a desolate, will become desolate with no one living in them, a curse on anyone who is lax in doing the Lord's work, Aye. Uh, a curse on anyone who keeps their sword from bloodshed. Moab has been at rest from youth, like wine left in the dredges, not poured out from 
one jar to another. She has not gone into exile, so she tastes as she did, and her aroma is unchanged. But days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will send men who will pour from pitchers. They will pour her out. They will empty her pitchers and smash her jars. Then Moab will be ashamed of, of uh, Chemosh, and as Israel was ashamed when they trusted in Bethel. How can you say we are warriors, men, valiant in battle? Moab will be destroyed and her towns invaded. Her finest young men will go down in slaughter, declares the king, whose name is the Lord Almighty. The fall of Moab is at hand. Her calamity will come quickly. Mourn for her, all who live around her, all who know her fame, say, how broken is the mighty scepter, how broken the glorious staff. Come down from your glory and sit in the parched ground, you inhabitants and daughter of Dibion, for you who destroyed Moab will come out up against you and ruin your fortified cities. Stand by the road and watch. You who live in Aero, 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 Aero I don't know. Uh, the man fleeing, the women escaping, ask them, what has happened? Well, what's happened is <clears throat> Moab is disgraced for she is shattered. Wail and cry out. Announced by the iron that Moab is destroyed. Judgment has come to the plateau, to Holon, Jaze, and Methath, to Dibon, Nebo, and Beth Dibliathame, to Kiriathame, Beth Gamul, and Beth Maon, to Kiriath and Basra, to all the towns of Moab far and near. Moab's horn is cut off, her arm is broken, declares the Lord. Make her drunk, for she has defied the Lord. Let Moab wallow in her vomit, let her be an object of ridicule. Was not Israel the object of your ridicule? Was she caught among thieves that you shake your head in scorn whenever you speak of her? Abandon your towns and dwell among the rocks, you who live in Moab. Be like a dove that makes its nest at the mouth of a cave. We have heard of Moab's pride. How great is her arrogance. Of her insolence, her pride, her conceit, and the haughtiness of her heart. I know her insolence, but it is futile, declares the Lord. And her boasts accomplish nothing. Therefore I wail over Moab. For all Moab I cry out. I moan for the people of Kir Hereseth. I weep for you as Jazer weeps, you vines of Sidma. Your branches spread out as far as the sea. They reached as far as Jazer. The destroyer has fallen on your ripened fruit and grapes. Joy and gladness are gone from the orchards and fields of Moab. I have stopped the flow of wine from the presses. No one treads them with shouts of joy. Although there are shouts, they are not shouts of joy. The sound of their cry rises from Heshbon to Elile and Jehaz, from Zoar as far as Horonaim and Egleth Shalishia. For even the waters of Nimrim are dried up, in Moab, I will put an end to those who make offerings on the high places and burn incense to their gods, declares the Lord. So my heart laments for Moab like the music of a pipe. It laments like a pipe for the people of Kir Hereseth. The wealth they acquired is gone. Every head is shaved and every beard is cut off. Every hand is slashed and every waist is covered with sackcloth. On all the roofs in Moab and in all the public squares, there is nothing but mourning, for I have broken Moab like a jar that, jar that no one wants, declares the Lord. How shattered she is, how they wail, how Moab turns her back in shame. Moab has become an object of ridicule, an object of horror to all those around her. This is what the Lord says. Look, an eagle is swooping down, spreading its wings over Moab. Kariath will be captured and the strongholds taken. In that day, the hearts of Moab's warriors will be like the heart of a woman in labor. Moab will be destroyed as a nation because the def she defied the Lord. Terror and pit and snare await you, you people of Moab, declares the Lord. Whoever flees from the terror will fall into a pit. Whoever calls out of the pit, climbs out of the pit, will be caught in a snare. For I will bring on Moab the year of her punishment, declares the Lord. In the shadow of Heshbon, the fugitives stand helpless. For a fire has gone out from Heshbon, a blaze from the midst of Sihon. It burns the foreheads of Moab, the skulls of the noisy boasters. Woe to you, Moab, the people of Chemosh are destroyed. 
your sons are taken into exile and your daughters into captivity. Yet I will restore the fortunes of Moab in days to come, declares the Lord. Here ends the judgment on Moab. This is what the Lord says. Has Israel no sons? Has Israel no heirs? Why then has Molech taken possession of Gad? Why, does it, why do his people live in its towns? But the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will sound the battle cry against Reba and or against Reba of the Ammonites. I will become a mound of ruins. It will become a mound of ruins, and its surrounding villages will be set on fire. Then Israel will drive out those who drove her out, says the Lord. Well, Heshbon, for Ai is destroyed. Cry out, you inhabitants of Rebah. Put on sackcloth and mourning. Rush here and there inside the walls. For Molech will go into exile. Together with his priests and officials, why do you boast? of your valleys, boast of your valleys so fruitful, unfaithful daughter of Amon. You trust in your riches and say, who will attack me? I will bring terror on you from all those around you, declares the Lord, the Lord Almighty. Every one of you will be driven away and no one will gather the fugitives. Yet afterwards, I will restore the fortunes of the Ammonites, declares the Lord. This is what the Lord Almighty says. Is there no longer wisdom in Timon? Has counsel perished from the prudent? Has their wisdom decayed? Turn and flee, hide in deep caves, you who live in Dedan. For I will bring disaster on Esau at the time when I punish him. If great pickers come, came to you, would you, sorry, let me start that over. If great pictures came to you, would they not leave a few grapes? If thieves came during the night, would they not steal only as much as they wanted? But I will strip Esau bare. I will uncover his hiding places so that he cannot conceal himself. His armed men are destroyed, also his allies and neighbors. So there is no one to say, Leave your fatherless children. I will keep them alive. Your widows, too, can depend on me. This is what the Lord says. If those who do not des deserve to drink the cup must drink it, why should you go unpunished? You will not be unpunished. You will not go unpunished, but must drink it. I swear by myself, declares the Lord, that Bo Bozrah, will become a ruin and a curse, an object of horror and reproach, and all its towns will be in ruins forever. I have heard a message from the Lord, an envoy was sent to the nations to say, assemble yourself to attack it, rise up for battle. Now I will make you small among the nations, despised by mankind, the terror you inspire and the pride of your heart have deceived you. You will live in the cliffs of the rocks who occupy the heights of the hill. Though you build your nest as high as the eagles, from there I will bring you down, declares the Lord. Edom will become an object of, of horror. All who pass by will be appalled and will scoff because of all its wounds. And Sodom and Gomorrah, Sodom and Gomorrah will overthrow. Be were overthrown as Sodom and Gomorrah were overthrown, along with their neighboring towns. Says the Lord. So no one will live there. No people will dwell in it. Like a lion coming up from Jordan's thickets to a rich pasture land, I will chase Edom from its land in an instant. Instant. Who is the chosen one I will appoint for this? Who is like me and who can challenge me? And what shepherd can stand against me? Therefore, hear what the Lord has planned against Edom. What he has purposed against those who live in Teman. The young of the flock will be dragged away. Their pasture will be appalled at their fate. At the sound of their fall, the earth will tremble. Their cry will resound to the Red Sea. Look, an eagle will soar and swoop down, spreading its wings over Basra. 
In that day, the hearts of Edom's warriors will be like the heart of a woman in labor. Concerning Damascus, Hamath and Arpad are dismayed, for they have heard bad news. They are disheartened, troubled, like the restless sea. Damascus has become feeble. She has turned to flee, and panic has gripped her. Anguish and pain have seized her, pain like that of a woman in labor. Why has the city of renown not been abandoned, the town in which I delight? Surely her young men will fall in the streets. All her soldiers will be silenced in that day, declares the Lord Almighty. I will set fire to the walls of Damascus. It will consume the fortresses of Ben-Hadad. Concerning Kedar and the kingdoms of Hazor, which Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, attacked, this is what the Lord says. Arise and attack Kedar and destroy the people of the east. Their tents and their flocks will be taken. Their shelters will be carried off with all their goods and camels. People will shout to them, terror on every side. Flee quickly away, stay in deep caves, you who live in Hazor, declares the Lord. Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, has plotted against you. He has devised a plan against you. Arise and attack a nation at ease, which lives in confidence, declares the Lord. A nation that has neither gates nor bars. Its people live far from danger. Their camels will become plunder, and their large herds will be spoils of war. I will scatter to the winds those who are in distant places, and will bring disaster on them from every side, declares the Lord. Hazor will become a haunt of jackals, a desolate place forever. No one will live there. No people will dwell in it. But Jehoiakim will not live to see vengeance brought on his enemies. Therefore, this is what the Lord says about Jehoiakim, son of Josiah, king of Judah. They will not mourn for him. Alas, my brother. Alas, my sister. They will not mourn for him. Alas, my master. Alas, his splendor. He will have the burial of a donkey, dragged away and thrown outside the gates of Jerusalem. Go up to Lebanon and cry out. Let your voice be heard in Bashan. Cry out from Abiram, Abarim, for all your allies are crushed. I warned you when you felt secure, but you said, I will not listen. This has been your way from your youth. You have not obeyed me. The wind will drive all your shepherds away, and your allies will go into exile. Then you will be ashamed and disgraced because of all your wickedness. You who live in Lebanon, who are nestled in cedar buildings, how you will groan when pangs come upon you, pain like that of a woman in labor. As for the other events of Jehoiakim's reign and all he did, are they not written in the book of the annals of the kings of Judah? Jehoiakim rested with his ancestors. Wow. We covered a little ground there. Whew. I've, I'm spent. <laughs> dog dog needs to go out daughter ah. crying something something, something ah. emerging in the background <laughs> <laughs> gotta go <laughs> oh brother you know uh i think there's probably all kinds of lessons but chief amongst them for me as we're reading is how horrible a thing it is to be on uh the outs with God. I mean, to be on yeah. the outside of the relationship with God, they've come to a place where um, your, your behavior has brought to, upon you his determination to bring distress. I mean, what an awful space to live. And whether that was the countries that were coming against uh, Judah or whether it was the Israelite people who have uh, long, long, long uh, worn out uh, the mercy uh, that God had bestowed on them, you know, hundreds of years they tested the Lord on on His His uh, His mercy and His grace for them, and and then as they periodically would uh, would cry out, He would stay His uh, His punishment, and now it's uh, it's being wrought, and there is a tremendous anxiousness in my heart at the notion that God has come to a place of of going, all right. You, you're going to get what you're going to get. And the people that come against you because they're coming against my people are still going to be punished. It's like, wow, this is just a, a hard, a hard set of text, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, it really is. And, and you know, I wonder sometimes, you know, it's like, I, there's a couple things that kind of rattle around in my mind. One of them is, 
you know, going back to some of what we've looked at in previous prophecy in relationship to the end times and with, uh, and with the tribulation and the establishment of, of uh, the, the second coming of Christ and the, and the seat of Jerusalem being where Jesus kind of said, he, I'm coming back to establish my kingdom here. And there is something that seems very, uh, God seems very territorial over that piece of land. Like, you know what? I have decided to establish my, my authority and my throne in that place. And, and I get that there's some that would say, no, 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 no. That, that misses the mark. Now that we're in the New Testament, it's, the kingdom is solely within us. Uh, but I look through all of this prophetic utterance of, of the, the, the kind of the second millennial kingdom and, and some of the language that Jesus used about the establishment of his kingdom on earth. And, and I, just can't, I just can't get my mind around the fact that God doesn't have a special purpose for Jerusalem, a special purpose for, for Israel. And, uh, and then to see some of the ways with which in the, since the 40s, it's kind of reestablished itself as a, a nation. Never has that ever happened before where a, a people group was so very vanquished and, uh, and, and scattered. And then to have a coming back and reestablishing a national identity just seems so incredible to me um, in light of prophecy. But yeah. when executed judgment against Judah, what sins in particular was he, God, unwilling to forgive? And what is important for us to take away from that? I mean, oh, that as was... I was alluding to, obviously, there's a cumulative lack of repentance, right? I mean, that's got to be part of it. Uh, but what were, the, what were the things that they were unrepentant of year after year and, and, uh, and really generation after generation in this case? Yeah. Well, um, you know, the second page that we read um, it was talking about the shedding of innocent blood. How so, in the world can you remember what was on the second page? <laughs> I know. <clears throat> I don't know. It's like a field the, trap up there, Linfield. It's yeah, like a field trap. right. Once in a while it works, and this time it worked. Uh -huh. And so it was, you know, in, in, at the second page, he says, For, for he had fi filled Jerusalem with uh, innocent blood, and the Lord was not willing to forgive. And so that's um, Manasseh, you know, uh shedding of innocent blood and and killing you know <clears throat> just the the children and he w did some you know s children's sacrifices and things like that and and god's like no nope, i'm not willing to forgive that at yeah. the, uh, and so there's a there's um an interesting part of god's character right there that um has a drew the line he just yep. drew the line and said that's not going unpunished right right you're not going to yeah you're not going to get away from from hurting my innocent people so mm -hmm. yeah you know i'm sorry I'm yeah, i was just going to say pete pete just said what where i was going to go you shall have no other gods before me and and time and time again you know they they go back to the Asherah poles, they go back to Baal worship. They, they, they keep going back to those things. We're supposed to have no other gods before him. And, and what's important to take away from that, I mean, I, I think today of the number of gods with a little g that we place in front of our God, the idols that, that, we, that we put up in our lives maybe. And um, that's pretty sobering. To, well, to and, think and, about. and again, to that point, Todd, it's, it's all those things that we look to, to, to kind of get our sense of identity or our feeling of life. Uh, what, are, what are we looking to, to sustain our life? What do we feel like we need that it has nothing to do with godliness or righteousness or holiness or his plan that we continue to look to as how do we feel okay? How do we feel good about ourselves? What are we turning to? Uh, those are the kinds of things that we would look at as, as modern day idols, right? Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What brought yeah, what Moab's destruction as a nation and how do we as a nation compare? Uh, it seems like Moab was, uh, they were, they were pretty uh, prideful, you know, area. 
that they were just concerned about themselves and they just was free loving and drinking and, <laughs> and partying and hippies. Huh, they were hippies. No, I don't know. If I don't that part. Think you know, if you if you look at if you look at you know you've got the sea of uh, the sea of Galilee, you've got the the river, in, you've got Jerusalem. Yeah. Over here, Moab, the Moabites were on the other side of the river, kind of a, a more of a deserty people, but there was still a river that kind of ran through their their territory as well as a um, a trade route that kind of went down along that side of the river. So there was a lot of trade, a lot of uh, a, a lot of uh, they had fortified cities and a lot of relative wealth. And then there was a uh, <clears throat> significant group of nomadic wanderers that were part of their, their tribal groupings. Um, but they were very, very significant uh, in their, in their uh, tribal warring uh, determinations. And so they had a fairly strong sense of identity. Uh, the Amorites had a lot of trouble trying to, kind of conquer them until they came down to get Judah. They all swept down. And that's when uh, really Moab comes into this problem with, uh, with destruction was really <laughs> when, when uh, Babylon now in the second wave is trying to take J uh, Jerusalem. And so uh, there's a, uh, an interesting history there with Moab, right? Yeah. Moab, the Moabites, they didn't really care. I mean, because they're, they're descendants of Esau. And yeah. so they thought they were the better people over the, you know, the people of, of Judah and, and Israel. Um, and so they didn't really care what happened on the other side of the river. Yeah. It's like, ah, we're, we're the, we're the better people anyways. You guys stole from us and. Yeah. You uh, stole the blessing, uh, so to speak. And, and now, yeah. and, and ever since then you've kind of sought your, saw yourself as all that in a bag of chips and, and we just don't have a lot of time for you. Right, right. You can deal with your own stuff. No. Um, but, uh, but that didn't really work out with the Babylonians, see? They didn't really care about that. Yeah. So, What is God's treatment of the helpless, even within the borders of his enemy, teach us about the character, about his character, and what should we, and what should that move us to do, if anything? Let me read the question again because I had too many stutters. What does God's treatment of it of the helpless, even within the borders of His enemy, teach us about His character, and what should we and what should that move us to do, if anything? It teaches us that God cares about the lowly and the poor in spirit and the oppressed and um, the people that are struggling more than others he cares about those people who get left by the wayside a lot by by others um it's almost as if don't you think josh that in the midst of bringing judgment he still brings justice and justice for him uh looks at those who are poor in spirit yes in fact that's so cool because i was listening to a podcast and it was just it was kind of analyzing the beatitudes and it was actually a focusing on the, the part of Matthew that talks about being salt and light, but it was connecting it to the Beatitudes. Mm -hmm. And it was pointing out this idea that uh, part of being the salt and of the earth and the light of, to the world is, is embracing uh, being the poor in spirit that God you know, is powerful through the weakness of and that kind of thing. And I just thought that was the coolest thing. Just whenever we're reminded that God's character uh, is is focused on loving, caring about every person, especially those who are the poor in spirit, mm -hmm. who he can, cares about when no one else does, mm. and uh, that's who he uses. And that's a you even see that um, shadowed here. I love that salt and light imagery. Anyway, the you know the for me, you know, immediately I think of throwing some some nice steaks on the big green egg and, uh, and putting a he heavy dose of salt on there. Cause I love savory and that mm -hmm. wouldn't have really been the image that they had. I, you know, I, I love that it savors the food, but I think what is more important was the preserving the nature of salt in their day. Right. Linfield. Yeah. Yeah. That's more preserving. I mean, that's what, you know, even our text talked about how throw salts on the, that city cause it was dying or is dead. 
just to preserve it. And so it was mm -hmm. more, more for pre preserving. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Salt is uh, essential for so many things, right? Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, it was without it, they couldn't have really, it would have been hard to live. So yeah. it, it, without Christians in the world, without Christ, without Christ's community, without God's community in the world, it's hard to live. And, uh, and they, they may not always appreciate, the world may not always, always appreciate the nature of what we bring as, as the kingdom of God dwelling within us is engaging the world. Uh, but they didn't always appreciate God and <laughs> his movement in the world either. Right. Uh, but uh, the nature of the kingdom of God in us, engaging the world around us, is what preserves the world in a meaningful fashion and brings light into dark places. Right, and I think one one reason that God um, really goes after the, you know the helpless and the the weary is because his his power is shown bigger and better uh, went through that. Um, you know, the, those that are not helpless, those that think they can do it on their own, you know, his his power is not shown through them. But you know, it's uh, our you know, his grace is sufficient for us, right? When yeah. Made perfect in our weakness. And yeah. so. You know, there was one spot in the reading where they, uh, where they had cut off the, the people's beards and, and uh, cut off the back of their pants and, you know, you know, and sent them back crying, you know, it, and I, I, I had to chuckle to myself because, you know, you know, really the, the humiliation nature of, of that piece of that storyline uh, where, you know, to them with their, with their full beards that, I mean, and their, you know, long hair, full beards. I mean, that was a sense of your, your male strength and identity. And now you're kind of being sent back baby faced and clean shaven. It wasn't until the Romans really that they re recognized that in war uh, you can grab onto someone's beard and, slice their head off quite quite easily that the beard is no real asset in battle uh and so uh just kind of a, a funny image that that they had that that's what masculinity looked like and so they're they're demasculating these these guys and sending them back full of shame right mm -hmm. what was the source of ammon's false sense of security and how have things stayed the same throughout time can we fight against it? I mean, what is the source of Ammon's false sense of security? <clears throat> that, well, part of it is that they didn't think they were um, uh, subject to God's wrath and, and um, his, what, what's happening. <clears throat> and so that's a, I don't know, that's a, they were thinking they were out of out of the harm's way, but they're they're not. They're, mm -hmm. and that was kind of a false security. Um, I, I think it was Chris who said arrogance. Yeah, that, that seems to rear its head over and over and over again. Why is that? And and Josh, I mean, I know you're kind of active in the chat, and I appreciate so much what you do there to keep people engaged. Uh, in that piece of it, but why is why is it that we can't figure out how to walk humbly as a nation? I don't know. Sometimes <laughs> I ask myself that question all the time. Why why can't I stop uh, being? That's so really what I was getting at. Is why yeah. can't you? <laughs> why can't you? <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, culturally, it just seems like we're so bent towards, you know, pomp and, and uh, building ourselves up. and Yeah. We're just self-centered. Sometimes I feel like everything we do, if you look at anything you do, even the, the most caring thing, like you can, you can kind of tie it back to self-centeredness. That's always driven me nuts. I'm like... What does real, what is real really, genuine altruism look like? What does that look like? And yeah. have I ever even been that before? Yeah. And uh, that's what we strive for because we know that God, that is part of his character. You know, and we're never going to 
we're never going to get there on our own. That's for sure. We need, uh, we need his forgiveness every day in order to attempt another day of hopefully walking humbly and loving mercy and fighting for justice, you know? Yeah. Yeah. The Ammons, they, they were, uh, they, they had mines where they were at. And so they would mine jewels and gold. And so they were a very rich area. And so sometimes I think it's the same with us that, uh, you know, our security is in, you know, how much, how much richness we have, how much money we have. And we can do all this stuff and, um, <clears throat> but it comes back to that arrogance that, uh, you know, we, we can do this on our own because we, we have the means. It's just us. We can do it. We don't need to fight. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, they trusted in their riches and say, who will attack me? I, you know, I, I won't, nobody will attack us. You know, when I worked at, um, in ministry down in the cities, uh, when I was really young, I mean, I was in my, in my twenties and I was the area director for, uh, Treehouse Youth and Family Outreach Center. And, you know, while I was doing that work, we worked in the, the campus that I, uh, was the director at was in New Hope on the kind of the close to the border of Northeast Minneapolis and uh, Robbinsdale and uh, New Hope, Robbinsdale, North Minneapolis. So it was kind of the, the, the tri city, a uh, little bit of crystal and uh, some in Brooklyn park. But I mean, there was just a, a real uh, unique kind of a group of kids that I worked with primarily that were pretty poor and we have another campus in Minnetonka and, uh, and desperate, uh, lonely, hurting kids in Minnetonka too. But, uh, but boy, do they masquerade and hide it differently. And it just struck me back then on how wealth can really prop up and hide sin and brokenness so much better than poverty can. And, um, when we moved uh, from the uh, Franklin Art Center, uh, the East Brainerd, over to the campus here in Baxter, I don't know if, you, if you've reflected much on it, Linfield, but over the years, I continue to reflect on how much better Baxter people are at hiding their sin, how East Gull Lake people are better at hiding and, and placating uh, uh, to, a, to a cultural norm that really ruins them but they but they prop themselves up because they've got the resources to um to medicate or to hide in ways that sometimes the impoverished don't and uh and i think ammon's false sense of security like you said came from their wealth and i don't know how we fight against that i just i can't figure out how to how to bring the law lawfully in a way that convicts people of sin when they can hide so well. Yeah. It, um, yeah, that's a, that's a good question. How do you, how do you do that? It's hard for a rich man, Bob, to enter the kingdom of heaven. Father God, as we come to a conclusion of our study today, we just recognize our wealth as a, a nation, our wealth as people. Um, and uh, the ways with which we try to trust in chariots. Help us not to do that. Teach us, Father God, to trust not in uh, what we have, but in in the provider that provided what we have. So help our turn our hearts towards you. Bring us to a place of a willingness to uh, cry out to you for the for the sin that so easily entangles and the pride that corrupts our very heart and uh, allow us to walk in a way that really does demonstrate a commitment and a faithfulness to, to you as our one true God, the God of Israel, Jacob, of, uh, of Moses. And, and let us recognize that, uh, that Jesus, you're coming back soon. So give us a hunger and a heart to, to be on mission with you in these days. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right, gang, love you guys. Blessings on you. uh, And we'll see you at nine o'clock online or 
at church this morning. Hopefully we'll, yeah. we'll see all of you at one of those places. Maybe both. Maybe a good one. Maybe even both. It is going to be a good one. Talk to you guys <laughs> later. Bye. 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 Bye.